Thank you, everyone. It's now 2 p.m. and we'll now reconvene the meeting to begin oral public comment. Um, I'd like to welcome and thank our public comment speakers for addressing the committee today. All the speakers submitted a request in advance of the meeting and the final list of public commenters was de determined via a lottery. For our speakers today, we have a limited public comment period and in order to make it through all of the listed speakers, it's extremely important each speaker limits his, her, or their remarks to three minutes. We are displaying a timer on the screen so you'll know how much time you have left. Um, as a gentle reminder, our committee appreciates diverse viewpoints that are respectful in nature and focused on the issues being discussed in our three-day meeting. Um, thank you again to our speakers, and we look forward to your comments. Our first public speaker is Mr. Jack Baker. Good afternoon. I'm Jack Baker with the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases, or NFID. As NFID commemorates its 50th anniversary during 2023, we celebrate the remarkable impact that vaccines have had in protecting public health and saving lives. As a longstanding partner of CDC, NFID appreciates the valuable work of ACIP in guiding U.S. immunization policy to protect public health through the ongoing review and analysis of vaccine safety and efficacy data. Our comments today focus on two respiratory viruses of concern, influenza and RSV. Influenza, or flu, is not just a cold, but can cause potentially life-threatening complications, even in healthy children and adults. During the current flu season, estimates show that at least 25 million people in the U.S. have become sick with flu, 280,000 have been hospitalized, and 17,000 have died from flu and related complications, including more than 100 children. Those affected are far more than just numbers, as clearly illustrated by the dozens of personal stories that NFID has collected of people whose lives have been impacted by vaccine-preventable diseases. Data also show that flu has a disproportionate impact on communities of color. Black adults are more likely to be hospitalized with flu-related complications and are less likely to get vaccinated against flu than white and Asian adults. In fact, during most flu seasons in the past decade, hospitalization rates among black adults have been about two times higher than among white adults. To help address these disparities, NFID is working with partner organizations to increase awareness of the importance of annual flu vaccination through the Show Up and Fight Flu campaign. Another respiratory virus of concern in the U.S., RSV, also has a substantial impact on individuals of all ages. Each year in the U.S., RSV causes an estimated 58,000 hospitalizations and 100 to 500 deaths among children younger than age five years, as well as 177,000 hospitalizations and 14,000 deaths in adults aged 65 years and older. In 2022, NFID issued a call to action on reducing the burden of RSV across the lifespan, which outlined key strategic priorities to drive progress in RSV surveillance, diagnosis, prevention, and treatment. Like flu, RSV also has a disproportionate impact on communities of color. As ACIP evaluates new interventions to protect both infants and older adults against RSV, Swift action will be essential to ensure equitable access through private and public payers, including the Vaccines for Children program. Additionally, developing clear, consistent communications will be critical in building public confidence and ensuring that these potentially life-saving new tools are available to all who need them. NFID values its longstanding partnership with CDC, and we look forward to continued collaboration to raise awareness about the importance of disease prevention through vaccination. On behalf of NFID, thank you for your dedicated service. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Mrs. Angie Blueford. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Angie Blueford, a 49-year-old mom of two. And at the beginning of 2021, I was in the best shape of my life due to a recent found love of kickboxing. On April 15th of 2021, I gladly took my second Moderna vaccine to protect my family, friends, and return to the gym. Since that day, I feel like I'm wearing a lead suit. The migraines, excruciating head pressure, and bone pain keep me from smiling as much as I used to. The shortness of breath, fatigue, cognitive, and speech issues have forced my second leave of absence since the vaccine. I've been denied short-term disability and most likely will again, considering that no one wants to acknowledge our injuries. The mRNA vaccine has put me and my family in financial, emotional, and physical strain. It robs the injured of our families, friends, employment, and hobbies. Why would we, the injured, choose to make this up? Per the CDC's website, verified again today, the mRNA from the vaccines is broken down within a few days after vaccination and discarded from the body. 
I have a test result showing that the spike protein was still present and wreaking havoc in my body 603 days after my last Moderna vaccine, and I've never had COVID. Per Dr. David Wiseman, Moderna disclosed at September's ACIP that their bivalents produce non-natural spike heterotrimers, something acknowledged to REACT-19 by FDA's Dr. Marks. EMA papers reveal Pfizer's bivalents likely do the same. Since this is new chemistry and new immunology, how can you recommend tetravalent vaccines with new untested toxicology? Dr. Weissman also shared that the CDC and FDA's statement at January's VRPAC that an ischemic stroke signal was only found in one database, FSD, is incorrect. Highly significant values for the PRR safety signals in VAERS emerged from CDC's recent FOIA disclosure and an NIH-sponsored calculator. How can CDC hold this withhold this information from unsuspecting seniors it is studying without informed consent? Last year, the German Ministry of Health publicly acknowledged post-vac syndrome, a disease like long COVID but occurs after COVID vaccination. Post-COVID vaccine syndrome is most certainly happening to Americans too. Why is the CDC silent with these important side effects? I implore you to remove the COVID vaccines from the schedule of recommended vaccinations for children until further study of adverse effects. Please hear, acknowledge, and help us. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Ms. Sarah Reganspan. Hello, thank you very much to the committee for the opportunity to speak. And I acknowledge that um, I didn't have the time to be as prepared as uh, the uh, our previous speaker. Um, I was also injured by the COVID vaccine. I took my third Pfizer vaccine on January 7th, 2022. And within hours, I developed burning chest pain and called my primary care doctor. I've never been hospitalized, but I was diagnosed by a cardiologist with vaccine-induced pericarditis. And over 13 months later, I am still suffering from symptoms that are preventing me from exercising normally and having a normal quality of life. My cardiologist has told me that they don't know why I'm ex still experiencing symptoms and that they have no more help to offer me. My primary care doctor says the same, although I'm very lucky that I have providers who do believe that this and that this is a vaccine-induced injury. I made a VAERS report. I've applied to the Countermeasures Injury Compensation Program. I would be happy to submit my medical records and proof of those filings to any members of the committee here who would like to see them. And I just want to point out that even vaccine injuries that do not result in hospitalization are extremely traumatic and lead to a great loss of quality of life. And there are no answers being provided for people like me. And I would really love to see the CDC and this committee, committee offer some support to those in the community like me who rolled up our sleeves and took not one, not two, but three of these vaccines because we were told it was for the greater good and we wanted to be of service to the community. I've now spent close to $25,000 of my own money and gone into credit card debt doing experimental treatments to try to recover as traditional cardiology medications have not solved the problem for me. So this has been an extremely painful and traumatic time in my life. It's been a very, very lonely journey, and it's disappointing to not see more, uh, more support from government entities like the CDC. And my worry is that it is going to continue to produce resistance to public health measures in the future as friends and family of those who are injured see that we are getting no support and no options for medical treatment and no acknowledgement from the CDC. So I really would urge you to look into these injuries and take them seriously so that uh, so that the public will trust and be part of public health measures in the future. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Christina Labette. Good afternoon, my name is Christina Labette. On April 21st, 2021, I freely received my second dose of the Pfizer COVID vaccine. 
Within 36 hours, my nightmare began, being rushed to the hospital, experiencing stroke symptoms. Today marks my 22-month anniversary of my injury, and I wish for you to please listen to my story. Prior to my injury, I traveled, did many outdoor activities. I was the mom who volunteered at school whenever needed, a cheer mom, a devoted wife, an active person who was free to do what I needed without assistance. Now, 22 months later, my life has forever changed. Struggling to live with debilitating cardiac and neurological symptoms, having to take multiple medications, needing assistance with da daily basic needs. Not only has my health deteriorated, I'm no longer able to be the mother or the wife that I was prior to the Pfizer injection. I have accrued over $35,000 in traditional medical bills, and I have no improvement. I am begging for help to heal from these injuries. I now suffer from over 30 new diagnoses with conditions such as blood clotting issues, tachycardia, dysautonomia, hemiplegic migraine disorder, diastolic dysfunction, small fiber neuropathy. These are just to name a few. I have been suffering unimaginable symptoms. These conditions are without question from my COVID vaccine. My life is consumed by appointments, testing, treatments. I'm just trying to survive this nightmare. It is a full-time job managing all of my health issues from the Pfizer vaccine. During our infertility journey in 2020, I had extensive clotting workups prior to starting treatments. All indicated I had no clotting genetics or factors, but now my labs are riddled with clotting issues. And worse yet, my husband and I can no longer pursue our dream of having another child due to the Pfizer vaccine. I am mostly bedridden and housebound now. I can't garden or provide for my family as I did previous to my injection. I just can't up and go as my body now dictates if I am capable of doing anything, including driving. I live in fear of if I'm going to live or die, as well as my child fears of losing her mother, so terrified she's in counseling now. I did my job getting the vaccine, so I ask you, why aren't you doing your job to help us get better? Why aren't you giving us a chance to recover from these injuries? We know you know this is happening. Why aren't you helping us? Here's a question for you all. What if this was your child, your parent, your loved one? What would you be doing to help them if they were injured by these vaccines? Why aren't you doing that to help me, to help us? We are real. We matter and we need your help. The German government has even acknowledged that these reactions as post-vax COVID syndrome, like a long COVID-like disease after COVID vaccination. So I ask you again, why aren't you helping us? Thank you for your comment. I want to thank all of our public comment speakers today for taking the time to share their um, uh, comments with us. Uh, we will now move on to the next section of the agenda, which is uh, votes. Uh, we have one vote on the table for monkeypox vaccine. I'm going to ask if we can please pull up the vote slide text so we can review it one last time. Thank you. Dr. Rao, would you mind just uh, reading the proposed wording for the committee and then I'll just ask if there's any additional questions or issues the committee would like to discuss before the vote. ACIP recommends the two-dose Chineos vaccine series for persons aged 18 years and older at risk of MPOX during an MPOX outbreak. And then the footnotes though there, so for two-dose, dose two is administered one month after dose one. And then the second footnote about uh, an MPOX outbreak says that public health authorities determine whether there is an MPOX outbreak. A single case may be considered an MPOX outbreak at the discretion of public health authorities. Other circumstances in which a public health response may be indicated include ongoing risk of introduction of MPOX into a community um, and disease activity in another geographic area. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or clarifications needed from committee members? Okay, I don't see any hands raised, so um, I'll assume the committee has no objections to proceeding with a vote. ACIP members, um, if you're able, please turn your video on, um, and I will go around and ask you to state your name, whether you have a conflict of interest, and then your vote. Thank you. I'm going to start to my right. Uh, Dr. Talbot. Kip Talbot, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Chen. Wilbur Chen, no conflicts, 
Yes. Dr. Lair. Jamie Lair, no conflicts, yes. Ms. Bata. Lynn Bata, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Daly. Uh, Matt Daly, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Brooks. Oh. Oliver Brooks, no conflicts, yes. Ms. McNally. McNally, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Bell. Bell, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Sanchez. Sanchez, no conflict, yes. Dr. Long. Long, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Dr. Cotton. Camille Cotton, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Sineas. Sybil Sineas, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Paling. Paling, no conflict, yes. And Lee, no conflicts, yes. So Dr. Wharton, can you give us the final count? Uh, it was unanimous, uh, 14 yes, um, no no's, no abstentions. Thank you, and the motion passes. Um, you can turn off your cameras now. And I wanna thank everybody uh, for a, a robust discussion around monkeypox and uh, for the vote. Um, at this point, we are just going to take a very short break and we are gonna reconvene early. Um, We'll reconvene at 30 minutes after the hour to uh, begin our pneumococcal vaccine session. Thank you.